Oh, you can do that? Mm -hmm. He I told me how. They wouldn't even dare give me that. There's no way I could ever get it on. So you hear me? Wonderful. <clears throat> well, I'm glad that you came. Uh, I know that this was publicized on television every day for hours. And, uh, you know, classical music today is not exactly um, as big as it once was. And we're going to talk about many things. I want to first of all say that I'm David Dubal and this is Ned Roram. And Ned is more famous than I am because he um, stood on his head on the Dick Cavett show. And he told me, don't say that. But of course I had to. And he will later on after we hear his music. It's a very contemplative piece. Ned, um, I want to say that I first met, and I call him the Nedness out of respect for a human being that has a little bit more flair level than the usual. Uh, the Nedness, Ned Roram, I met around 1970. Can you believe that? It's unbelievable. And um, at that time he did a radio program with Virgil Thompson, which I produced at WNCN, and they got into a big argument on the uh, radio and uh, about songs, I believe, I don't know if you remember. Uh, uh, yeah, I remember the argument. I forget what it was about. Well, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about the three great composers that have died recently, Copeland, Bernstein, and Virgil Thompson. And I want to say that Ned Roram was born in Chicago, and he told me to say that, remember, 12 books he wrote. He's not only a composer, he is a writer. And his books, by the way, are very important to American letters. Uh, some of them are called Critical Affairs, Settling the Score, Music and People, A Composer's Journal. He's written operas, he's written piano works, he's written, my God, I would say 350 songs, you think? Perhaps. Perhaps <clears throat> that many. The American Schubert. Um, he has lived most of his life in the United States, but he also is, I would say, a very French-American because he lived in Paris and loved it for at least eight years of his life. Ned Roram's music has been honored, has been played. I think you won a Grammy this year, didn't you? Uh, yes. Atlanta Symphony doing the string orchestra piece, uh, which we will be hearing. And you also won the Pulitzer Prize and now I'm going to ask my first question. How did music happen in the life of the Nedness? <clears throat> I very early understood <clears throat> that the universe is divided into two aesthetics, French and German. <laughs> Everything is either French or German. Women are French, men are German. Blue Absolutely. is French, red is German, cold is French, hot is German, uh, gay is French, straight is German, unless it's the <laughs> other way around. <laughs> if this is true, uh, and it is true, and if you disagree with me, it simply means you're German, so I can't lose. <laughs> what do I mean by this? I mean that <clears throat> uh, French, in the profoundest way, is a superficial fashion of looking at things. Most of our daily intercourse is with people we don't really communicate with, on, except on a sort of a, a skimmy level, like the hat, to, like the checkout girl at the A and P, uh, or looking at a beam of sunlight on a water lily, as Monet, Monet did, and capturing it for one split second, or as Debussy did on the waves. It's superficiality preserved and made deep. German is, in the shallowest sense, profound. The French, the Germans will belabor a point until the cows come home. They will take a theme such as diapapapam and uh, play it 742 times. They analyze the meaning of it. They analyze what jokes are. A German joke is no laughing matter, as the saying goes. <laughs> if, if this is true, and neither is good nor bad, uh, I fall roundly into the French category. 
And perhaps that's because of my background. I was born not in Chicago, but in Indiana, but raised in Chicago. And of converted Quakers, my mother's younger brother was killed in the First World War, and she never got over the trauma of that. And we were, my sister and I, forbidden all contact with the glamour of Catholicism. So to this day, the, the smell of incense in the Catholic Church is enough to make me swoon. But I like also uh, the economy, the control of French culture, as distinct from the uh, lack of economy and the lack of control, in, as I see it, in German culture. So that's how it started. I was very attracted toward a certain kind of music. Inadvertently, my musical training was entirely with contemporary music. That's how it happened. I took to the contemporary music of my youth, which was Debussy and Ravel, and in Chicago, John Olden Carpenter, <laughs> and uh, early Copland and Griffiths and so on. I took to it as a duck to water. It didn't, I vaguely knew the names of, of Chopin, of Bach, and when I finally had to study them, I had to accustom myself to them the way most people do to contemporary music. It's still that way. I feel that my education was right and that everybody else's is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I also think that my education is typical of every century except the 20th, wherein one learns the contemporaneousness of art automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, music in America today is the only art, I might add, which does limp along behind the times. Let's get back right to those early moments. Did you sing? Did you play the piano? And may I, may I add one thing about the Germans? The greatest of their sins is that, that they invented the footnote. <laughs> um, what did you do during that? I, I didn't mean, sing. It? I played the piano huh? and I began taking, as we say, the piano with the same time as my sister who was a year and a half older. I might have been eight, she would have been nine. That's fairly late. But I was immediately better than she was and sibling rivalry set in. She stopped playing. And as soon as I got good enough to get around the keys, I would make up pieces. Mm -hmm. And the pieces were madly uh, uh, impressionist with very grandiose titles. And my so you were using ninth chords at nine years old? Mm, I was... I, the, the kind of stuff that I learned was really junk. My teachers were no good. And I learned a piece called Mealtime at the Zoo, for example, crossed my hands, which my parents' friends adored. But when they saw what they had wrought, this little boy that crossed his hands and played Mealtime at the Zoo, they gave me to a real teacher who happened to be Margaret Bonds, who was not only a woman but black in Chicago. This is in the 30s. And people didn't study with black composers, but my parents were progressive. And I would take the uh, bus out to her house on Wabash Avenue in the, in the sort of ghetto area of Chicago and take these lessons. And the first lesson, she played both Ravel and a piece of John Olden Carpenter's and a piece of Griffiths, the white peacock for me. Mm. And I was intoxicated and I had a quasi-nervous breakdown from which I haven't yet recovered. <laughs> and I think that the sickness that, that came onto me is not sickness really at all, but the virus of health, uh, which is caring about something that really matters, and not money. And I remember saying to Father, uh, I want to be a composer, and that is not what young Americans say. They say, <laughs> I want to be a fireman, or today they say, I want to be a lawyer, or a something that deals stock with money. Stockbroker, stockbroker. Yeah. And that father's... Investment banker. Father says, he said to me, how are you going to make a living? And I apparently answered, I don't care as long as I have enough mm -hmm. to keep a roof over my head and can do what I want to do on my own terms. And they were, I bless them to this day that they were very encouraging to me about that and they were until quite late in my life. Well, your parents were, were adored Mentors. by you always, yes. Well, Love them. and I by them. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get you, uh, you were not a prodigy, because uh, the books never a, say that. I wasn't a prodigy. My earliest 
things that were any good were songs. And I, I was kind of a prodigy. No, I wasn't a prodigy because I didn't practice enough. Right. I wasn't interested in being a performer. The fact that you said you're still intoxicated with the white peacock, so to speak, all impressionist music, you always loved Debussy, uh, Ravel. Is it still with you, this love of the French uh, composers of that time? Yes, it is. Yeah. And that which I look for in any music from... Uh, I forgot to mention in my little list that Schubert is French and Berlioz is German, <laughs> if you see what I mean. So that I look, when I listen to German music I, that I like, like Rosenkavalier, which is nothing if not German, nevertheless, that which attracts me is the uh, directness of it, if it's there, the delineation of melodic lines and the lack of fat. German orchestration, for example, is uh, doubles at all times so that you know, know quite who's playing what. And French orchestration doesn't, so that in Ravel, you can, it's crystalline. How do you rank Mozart? Is he German or French? He would be French, I suppose, but I, one would have to add that I'm speaking of that which occurred since the Industrial Revolution, okay. when everything changed. Ned, we, we know now the French affiliation, and the first time you had a chance, you went to Paris. Is that right? Yes, people often say, to, they don't often say, but it's, it's been said to me, well, your stay in France certainly has stamped your music. In fact, I was French before I went to France, and it was like going home to a home where I'd never been. And uh, the life that I led in France from 1949 through 57, unlike, say, the life of George Plimpton or, or Jimmy Baldwin or other Americans of my generation who were living in France. It was a French life with French people rather than American life with Americans uh, starting the Paris Review mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And f I think, incidentally, having said all this, that France is the least musical country on this planet. France has produced great, great music but France is essentially a visual and verbal country, yes. and they don't know how, they like to talk about music, but they don't really like to listen to it. And an American composer, it's okay if he's there, as I was, drumming up trade, but when you leave, they don't play your music. And it's not just me. They'll mm -hmm. play maybe John Cage or maybe uh, uh, music that's a la mode, but they don't play it for its musical purposes. Yes. Americans are not known in France. The same Americans today as yesterday are in France, that's still Jerry Lewis and John Cage. Mm -hmm. No Copeland, Bernstein, no. Virgil, even Virgil who lived there so long? Virgil is not a known quantity in mm -hmm. France. Admittedly, I don't go to France anymore, but my feeling is that France doesn't know anything about anything anymore. But then, of course, neither does America. Yes. Well, we'll get to that soon, but I think we should start hearing a little bit of your music. One movement from which work? It's uh, <coughs> always uh, makes me squirm a little bit to sit immobile and listen to my own music, uh, but I never knew what to do, whether you want to, to leave? smile or... Uh, you want to we, go out? But we can do it if you want to. No, okay. we can sit. No, I would love to hear at least one movie. Okay, this is... Uh, about six, seven years ago, I wrote a string symphony for the Atlanta Symphony. It's in five movements, of which six movements, or five or six, I forget which, of which this is called Nocturne. It's the fourth movement. And it's about eight minutes, not only about, it's exactly eight minutes and 13 seconds long. Atlanta Symphony? Pardon? The, the Atlanta Symphony, uh, Robert Shaw conducting. <laughs>
listening to that just now, and I haven't listened to it for about a year, but it's not really French. But they, then again, the composer can't judge his own music, I don't it's, think. It's also, it's not Irish, no, it's not because Irish. The, the inventor of the nocturne form is an Irishman, John Field. Mm-hmm. So I think, though, from John Field to Ned Roram, there's been a great distance in the... Uh, in the heat of the form, you know, it's, it's more evocative than oh, ever. Oh, uh, I called it Nocturne long after I wrote it. Yeah. I didn't sit down and write a Nocturne. Ned, you won a, a, an award for this on television, a Grammy, right? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Now, you've won the Pulitzer Prize, you've won many awards, you're commissioned constantly. Um, what does this mean to you when you, you win an award? Is, is that good for, for all that. of classical music, or do you, do you just, you know, find it helpful to yourself? The money part is good if there's any money, but there's not in a Grammy, and there isn't in a Pulitzer Prize. The Pul- when I got the Pulitzer in 1976, I thought somebody had made a mistake. I, I came home, I remember, from a depressed, debauched uh, salt tea. About 8 o'clock in the evening, the phone was ringing, and somebody from Cincinnati said, may I be the first to interview you? And I said, about what? And I had tripped over a telegram coming in the door, which, and he said the Pulitzer, and I, and I said, there must be some mistake. Pe- they don't give Pulitzers to people like me. <laughs> uh, Why not? In those days, uh, first of all, I had written a lot of diaries that were extremely revelatory, or so they seemed then, but in fact they're pretty tame now. Uh, you don't give diaries, to, you don't give Pulitzers to people who write diaries that are revelatory. You give them to, to academics. And second of all, the nature of my music, which is accessible, which is not problematic, is not Pulitzer's stuff. And at that time, the whole uh, psychology, not only of the Pulitzer, but of what music was in general, the language of music was beginning to change, and so I got it. And uh, it means, therefore, that whenever you're mentioned any place ever, uh, it says Pulitzer Prize winner Ned Roram was found drunk in a hotel where he <laughs> killed himself. Or, but it's always prefaced with, with Pulitzer Prize. So it, that means a lot as far as your cachet is. In well, you're very respectable now, you're saying. Yes, I'm yes. very prudish. But I, I do want to recommend, um, although they're no longer scandalous, his marvelous Paris and New York diaries. You'll get to know a lot about Ned Roram and uh, a lot about many things musical too and about French life and so forth, and in New York, in, in a tremendous moment, I think, in New York's history culturally. I think you wrote those with uh, great passion. Now there is still diaries coming out of you, though, but they're final diaries. Uh, let me see. Well, final. Yeah. Uh, I called one final yes, and then did. changed the title when it was reprinted I to see. the later diaries. I didn't get that reprint. Then I did a diary after the final diary that is about 14 years long, called the Nantucket Diaries. So, yeah, I guess they're still going. Ned, uh, today the word composer is really in jeopardy. I mean, young people have no idea what a composer is. I've asked them, do you know what a composer is? Uh, to them, rock and roll is, is music, and the, com- the composer and the performer, they write the music and the lyrics, and that's all they know. In the past 25 years... <clears throat> Uh, there, since the beginning of time, there's been two musics that have run parallel, which is the music of the church or the, and the, or the music of the state, the music of the church, and the music of the people. Three musics, in fact. Uh, but since the Industrial Revolution that we're talking about, the music of the church sort of uh, didn't count any longer, but there was the state and the people. And the music, of the, music of the church is generally rather amorphous. It doesn't, uh, it is anti-sexual and there's no regular beat to it. The music of the people, especially in America, or slave songs, is a, has a regular beat, which also keeps people working on assembly lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, that all began to merge the beginning of this century. And after pop music became respectable in, let's say, 19... 65 with the Beatles when intellectuals, not musical intellectuals, but general intellectuals, literary intellectuals, who were sick of listening to Elliot Carter anyway and pretending they liked it and were given carte blanche to the respectability of listening to the Beatles began to 
the, the two areas began to merge, and pop music began to be pay, taken seriously, especially because it made a lot of money. And non-pop music began to be edged off, the, uh, off of the charts. The two things are, as genres, essentially different. They are aiming at different targets and uh, have different audiences although there are really as many audiences as there are composers in this world, there is no one audience. I think that that is unhealthy, and I also think that young, young people, as you say, don't know quite what music is. It's not just young people. If you say that you're a composer in, in, in the, the better cocktail parties, people still don't know what you mean. Mm -hmm. if, if they don't know that you uh, are a composer that doesn't make money. Mm -hmm. When I look at uh, what's going on now, I'm in more and more in despair. And as I said earlier, music is the only area in which this is taking place because on, in the performing world of so-called serious music, 99% uh, of programs are of 19th century music or earlier. Yeah. Whereas on the, in the theater, plays are by living playwrights. They may be lousy, but there they are. And if they're not by living playwrights, they're called revivals. Mm -hmm. So Edward Albee is a revival. But we don't talk about a Beethoven revival when Beethoven is the rule. Yes. Uh, what would you say to a young musician at Juilliard, an 18-year-old uh, pianist who comes up to you and says, um, my friends uh, tell me that uh, heavy metal is just as good as Beethoven. This is an egalitarian society, and uh, she doesn't know how to answer. The pianist would not be coming up to me, first of all. You as a pianist, they come up to you. And if they did, they wouldn't be talking about that. They'd mm -hmm. talk about something else. But young composers come up, but they don't. Some of them do. I, yesterday I spent a couple of hours with a young composer I'd never met before who was very interested in what they call amalgamation. But you see, amalgamation has been around forever. Uh, Brahms amalgamated uh, Hungarian gypsy sure. songs, and Copeland was bringing jazz into American music 70 years ago before uh, the kids today are doing it. They yeah. think they're doing something new, but of course they aren't. Uh, your first fame came as the songwriter, Ned Roram, and you were always said to be the foremost American composer of art songs, and yet uh, I would venture to guess that the uh, the song, song recital is dead. The song dead. recital is a pretty much of a dead issue. My first pieces that were any good were songs, and whatever my worth as a composer is, I flatter myself that of the 250-odd different writers that I've set to music, I've never chosen a, a bad one, from, from Sappho to uh, John Ashbery, mm -hmm. generally in English or in a language that I purport to, to comprehend. Uh, I was not interested in songs because I was interested in the human voice, and I'm still not very interested in the human voice. <clears throat> I'm interested in poetry, and I was therefore interested in... Uh, conjoining my two loves, which were poetry and music. In America, if you're a non-specialist, if you're a general practitioner, you're generally thought to be superficial if you don't concentrate on only one thing. And in Europe, at least until recently, everyone had to be a general practitioner simply to make both ends meet, so that from Leonardo to Noel Coward, people have been able to do many different things, and even within a given, given genre, a composer would write, would write uh, vaudeville music or movie music or string quartets or symphonies or operas or what have you, or pop songs. Anyway, I, I, but I, I had written some of my best songs before I knew the difference between mezzo-soprano and soprano. Mm. Then I looked it up in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And I feel that singers to this day are inclined to want to pigeonhole themselves a little too much. But how do you feel about the fact that you have composed so many and they will not be sung in recitals because the recitals don't exist? They get sung a little bit, but mm -hmm. less. And it's true that you can count on the fingers of neither hand uh, an American singer in this country of 250 million souls, hmm. there is not one single singer uh, who earns his or her living primarily as a recitalist. There are, a lot of opera singers give recitals, and then a lot of specialists like Phyllis Benjules and Jan de Gaetani and give recitals too, but they don't earn their living. They don't make a cent out hmm. of these recitals. It's too bad, and I doubt if it'll come back. People who write for, this, for The Voice today write for the, write for the voice in 
conjunction with other instruments. It's chamber music, voice, plus bass flute, yeah. plus, plus viola, plus vibraphone. Living in the United States most of your life, is life better now for a musical composer uh, than, let's say, when you were growing up? Because let's say like a man, Griffiths, he, he, he really died of a, a spiritual isolation at the age of 36 in the, ni in the 19, late teens. I wasn't around, so I don't know. And I can't, one can't know why Griffiths died. Do you feel isolated died. now? No, mm -hmm. but I feel that uh, <clears throat> when I was first beginning was right after the war, the Second World War, when everybody was beginning and there was a real exciting fomentation during the war as well as right afterwards. And the young, the young playwrights, young novelists, young composers who were really hot stuff. But there weren't that many. Yeah. Today there are, so that when we got performances there were six or ten or twelve of us, uh, or, I, or of them, uh, it's still kind of the same group. Today, the irony is that there are more composers than there are cockroaches, and they are terribly skillful. And I look at competitions several times a year of under 30s, and as distinct from 20 years ago, the music looks terrific on paper. It's very proficient. They know how to orchestrate. They know how to think of titles that are really terrific, like uh, Eating Live Monkeys or... The, uh, the golden unicorn, or I don't know what. It's which no never, longer structures for. It's never symphony. Yeah. And the titles have need, nothing much to do with it. But, and the music is all terribly, quote, meaningful. And you wish that the moping around would get to the point. Uh, here they all are. They're winning prizes. They get their music played, too. Yes. But it's, they get it played because they're in school, and the school yes. plays it. When they get out into the real world, then what's going to happen to no. them? I simply don't know. Nothing. The, 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 the irony is that there are so many composers, and they do care. And on the other side, nobody else cares. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you're not sleeping, three in the morning, do you feel, oh, my God, I've written a lot of music, uh, that something will survive? Or do you not think of that? I think less of it. The business about what will survive, it's not for m me to judge my own work. It's not for any artist. I, I use the word advisedly. It's a rather pretentious word. But it's not for any so-called creative artist to know what's going to happen to him or to be able to judge himself. When people say, are you better than you used to be? I don't really think people get better. I don't think... Uh, there are certain composers who simply are born like out of Zeus's head full-blown. Chopin's an example, Ravel's yeah. another example. They didn't improve, they were pretty much the same kind of music all their life. None of it was bad. There are other people like Stravinsky or Beethoven who have what we call periods, though the farther away we get from these periods, the more homogenized it is, and we see it's really all the same voice speaking. I don't know that, that Beethoven got better. You're either good or you're not. A lot of people get worse. Uh, but Who got worse? I think that uh, it, in the, not in the area of music for a moment, in the area of playwriting I th in America, I think there is not one playwright who has been better after the age of 40 than he was before 40. Mm -hmm. The reason being that uh, American plays are about the body. Americans are young people. They're concerned with uh, with self-expression, in quotes, and with sex, and with death, and with big emotions. After a certain age uh, in France, you can write philosophically, as Sartre did, or Monterlain, or Claudel, and write grown-up plays. In America, there are very few grown-up plays. That even goes for Arthur Miller. Certainly, it's true of Tennessee Williams. They all got sure. progressively worse and worse. In music, some composers just stopped. Sibelius just stopped, Rossini stopped, and they lived many years mm -hmm. Uh, more or Many less hap rich yeah. and happy afterwards. Uh, I wouldn't presume to say... Of Many music, repeated uh, themselves uh, over and over, of course. I think everyone repeats themselves, and I don't think that anybody, any artist, has more than four, the best, have four or five ideas in their whole life. But you take an idea... And you do it big, you do it small, you do it pink, you do it purple, you do it for uh, chamber groups, you mm -hmm. do it for solo voice, and, you, and so on. And you, then you get a new idea, 
Larry Rivers is a perfect example of who would concur with what I'm saying. Uh, or Picasso. Picasso would do goats for a year, big goats, little goats, or women with long hair, or women crying, and he would stick to an idea. He just had 14 or 15 good ideas. Most people have four or I five. I would say Picasso had about six, but it depends on how you split them up. But still, it's not a question of constantly being new, <laughs> and, it, and the whole question of artists who say, I don't like to repeat myself, and they impress people with that noble sentiment. In fact, everybody repeats himself. Yeah. And the human body couldn't, we don't need that many ideas. What we knew is, need is to take the ideas, make them communicable. Mm -hmm. The trouble with, with, for example, rock singers during the Vietnam War, uh, Bob Dylan, they have got their heart in the right place, certainly, and what they are saying that the war is bad. Uh, but they play the guitar sort of, sort of no good with a, two or three chords, and they mm -hmm. sing their hearts out and because their hearts are in the right place, it's great art. But in fact, it's not great art in the sense that it, is, that it has been congealed into something that can be transmitted. Right. It has to be, can only be transmitted live. And, uh, and by them. And by them. Of course, that's then what's the difference between pop and classical. Yes. And I don't mean to uh, denigrate pop music, and I certainly don't think classical music is necessarily better. But the difference is, uh, and I know what the difference is, because I just wrote an, I just turned an essay in yesterday at Opera News about uh, American opera. What is it? Uh, pop music is is music uh, for a certain kind of voice that. Uh, is trained in its own way according to certain precepts. But you can take a pop song, say, of Stephen Sondheim, a first-class song, sing it slow, sing it fast, sing it high, sing it low, sing it by a man or by a woman, re-instrumentalize it, reorchestrate it, and it still retains its own integrity. You can't take a song of Schubert and do that and still have it retain its own integrity. And it can only be sung by a Schubert-trained voice. Yes. And it goes without saying that Barbara Streisand, no matter how hard she tries, can't do the Queen of the Night. <laughs> and although someone who sings the Queen of the Night can technically do what Barbara Streisand does, or a soprano like Eileen Farrell, it's still slumming in a way. Yes. yes. So the two things are, don't... Uh, classical singers sort of whore around with that kind of music, but they're not really impressing anybody. Yes. Whereas pop people don't give a goddamn, they just don't. That's right. Most of them. Right. Now, three giants of the American scene have passed, and uh, they really were giants. Uh, when Copeland died, I was amazed that there was actual TV coverage. I was even on CBS News, because I knew him for a year. Uh, it seemed to be that they were saying, this is the last great American name in, in music. Uh, then Bernstein died, and I was surprised how little co coverage. But the main thing I want to ask you is that you knew Virgil Thompson. You even, I think, studied somewhat with him. Uh, you knew Copeland very well and Bernstein well. Uh, how do you feel about uh, Virgil Thompson as writer and as composer? Now that they're all dead, yes. and one can see them in retrospect, Actually, Bernstein died first, and my impression was the reverse of yours. He died in a year ago, uh, this October, just last October, mm -hmm. and he, I've, my impression was that he had a vast amount of coverage, and that when Copeland died uh, eight weeks to the hour after Bernstein died, I was surprised at how little coverage he had. Oh, really? Virgil died two years before. No coverage, the, uh, almost. Well, a little tiny bit. Uh, my feeling in retrospect now <clears throat> is that, and I did know them and love them, I suppose, in different ways, and I'd known them all in my teens, so I really knew them from, from when I was a kid. Uh, I f feel that Lenny Bernstein holds up admirably, and I think that a lot of what one didn't like about him, his vulgarity, uh, the, has softened a great deal, and a lot of what was vulgar isn't. It was... It was uh, a kind of a chutzpah that was really caring and that he did a lot of good. And I think some of his trashy music isn't trashy. I've listened to a great deal. Yeah. I had to write it since he died and I had to write some articles. And I think much of it holds up 
like uh, 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 the best of American music ever. Yes. With Aaron Copland, uh, he, is, he sort of is what he is, and the interesting thing about that is that Copland was uh, pretty much in the collective unconscious, but the young composers weren't, weren't imitating him. Today they are. Mm-hmm. They may not know it, but they are. Mm-hmm. Virgil, in retros- Virgil Thompson, in retrospect, is not a very important composer. I don't think that almost none of his music, except the operas, is worth much, in my opinion. But I think that two of his three operas, the one on Gertrude Stein's, are, for some crazy reason, the reason being the happy uh, potion that was formed out of Gertrude Stein and Virgil Thompson, mm-hmm. that neither of them could have known beforehand when these two things were poured into the same glass. Mm-hmm. It created something that had never existed before and has never existed since, and that is, that it stands, that it is American, not because it's about America, Four Saints and Three X is not about America, but is American because of the d- diction of Gertrude's words, which were American words, and words that could only have been written by an expatriate who was far enough away from them to, to make them, to congeal them. And Virgil's musicalizing of those words of, by taking his utterly American background, which was very Gentile, and Gertrude's, which was Jewish, but uh, putting these uh, Protestant hymn tune things to her words as though the words made sense, which they don't. Yes. Uh, but they do. Actually, no sung words ever make sense. Music just doesn't make sense. It makes something else. It makes its own sense. Yes. And I think in that, in that way that, 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 that he will or won't live. But posterity is a question of posterity, and we can sit and idly conjecture till the cows yeah. come home, but in two years everybody may be, may be forgotten. Now you are one of the most famous living American composers, um, and this question may be indiscreet, but uh, it does bother me. Are you yet making a living as a composer? Yes, I am, and I, and I knock wood, and I feel uh, very, very lucky, and my living is... I, I do, I've always done only what I want to do, and I've never done what I don't want to do. I do teach part-time at Curtis because I like to do it, and the, and the salary is negligible. Uh, so I earn my living as a composer, which means that I earn my living as, off of commissions, and it's the commission that is... It's not publication, it's a commission, so uh, the commission must be enough to keep me in cornflakes for the time it takes to write the piece and pay the rent. Mm-hmm. After that, it doesn't really come from performances of that music or the publication of it. So I live from commission to commission yeah. and on advances of my prose, but I haven't earned, I've earned much less from the prose than one might think. I think I'm very lucky in that way because other people always have had to do something that they don't want to do. I play in public a little bit with, with singers, but I make not that much money doing that, although I love to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, you've answered the question, and you're one of the few composers then making a living. Now, I'll ask you, if no commissions came in, would you dry up? Would you just say, I am not going to compose anymore? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I think that uh, the business... Uh, it's the business of getting up, as I used to do, from the dining room table and rushing to the piano. Uh, the business of self-expression... Which, which the lay person loves to hear about and inspiration and so forth, is something that is very self-indulgent. It goes without saying the composer is inspired. He wouldn't be a composer in the first place. The important thing, as I said a while ago, is to take that inspiration. Everybody's inspired. Everybody uh, feels deeply about something. A composer doesn't know more than another person does. An artist doesn't think more deeply than another person. What he does is to be able to take what everybody knows and make and make it communicable mm-hmm. so that he will take these deep and he's as a human being he's certainly no better than he ought to be he's no saint uh, he, he's usually a sinner mm-hmm. although I do have feel strongly that an artist is the least neurotic person on earth and that loves well you're no longer neurotic but you used to be very neurotic 
Insofar as I was not an artist, I may have been neurotic. <laughs> but I think that an artist is the only person who is sort or another. This even goes for bad artists, mm. uh, of which Very I may be one. But <laughs> if I, but appreciation is terribly important. It's important from babyhood, and if what I do, if. Today, if I don't see my name in the paper once a week, or if somebody doesn't tell me how wonderful I am, or even something bad, but or my music played, or published, or this and that, I want to throw in the sponge because I'm very insecure, mm -hmm. as any as any composer is, because there's nothing to be secure about. There's no, uh, there is no uh, social security for being a composer at yes. all. Yes. I, to answer your question, I'm old enough to, uh, I don't, I've written almost everything that I need to write. The question is, am I getting better? I don't, as I said, I don't think people get better, but I think I have a lot more technique uh, than I used to have. I mm. can put a big piece together, but I don't know that I could write a song today that is as immediate or as good or as, it's, it, could, it would be as well honed, but is it, has, can I make it, breathe and bleed. I can teach anybody in this room to write a perfect song. I really believe that. But I can't teach them how to make it bleed and breathe, nor can I guarantee that my own is going to bleed and breathe. In other words, communicate and be alive. If I didn't get any more commissions, uh, uh, but I will. Mm -hmm. Because the, the ball is rolling and the the inertia is, is going and one simply does. Well, the insecurity is fading away. No, I'm, I, I'm terribly insecure, but I have a certain sense of my own value and I have survived, and that's saying a hell of a lot. You know, we have about seven minutes, really. I don't want I, to play any more music. You really don't I, want no, to play your music? I find it... Uh, I find it. I find this. If, if if anyone here wants to hear my music, they can get it at a store. I may never see anybody here again. So let's take advantage of of talking about virtually anything. Okay, in those let's seven let's talk about uh, let's talk about the United States right now. Um, what it means to be an artist in it, or just a citizen. How do you feel about the way our country is going? I think that people talk about. Young composers are very inclined to talk about wanting to represent the times in their music. We have to be where it's at. Unless we are reflecting what's going on, we are worthless. It's so much pap, it's so much in the past. My, and they say that, and they could only say it because they're young. What they don't realize is that anybody Anything anybody says or purports to say as art or just in conversation is of the times by definition. A work of art created today, good or bad or long or short, is by the times is of the times simply by virtue of being created in the times. Therefore, if the composer is very reactionary, which most of them are, these young kids are very reactionary as far as non-experimental language is concerned, you're not of the time simply because you incorporate uh, a, a, a punk music into your life. Uh, you're, on the t you're of the time simply because you're breathing the air of the 20th century. I also don't think that the times today are any worse than they ever were. I think all times are terrible. I think that the times when Mozart was living and writing this wonderfully light music, or the times of Kurt Weill when he was writing very light music about very horrendous tortures, uh, and the irony of the, of the juxtaposition of these two things is what gave it its strength. All times are terrible, and all time, and the, but the artist, for his brief, for his 15 minutes, uh, can get away from it. He has to be able to get away from it, be able to write it down. You can't write music or paint a picture with tears in your eyes, uh, because the tears make the ink blur and everything becomes a mess. You have to get away from it and objectify what you feel. The the sentimental notion that an artist who is suffering uh, is the great artist, and the even worse notion, the artist is starving, is better than the artist who ain't, uh, is disgusting. Uh, a hungry artist may write good music in spite of being hungry, but not because of it. 
I don't think that the time, I think that we, oh, and nobody can really see the times. No, uh, people always say we are in an area of transition, but every area mm. is transition. My feeling, nevertheless, and one can't help but want to s generalize, is that the times are not particularly good for any of the arts, any place in the whole world. I think that performance in music of standard classics is more dazzling than ever. At Curtis, where I am, there are people this high, mainly from Korea, uh, girls from Korea, mm -hmm. 8 to 12 years old, who can play rings around Horowitz. Uh, what, whether, no longer. They, whether they are saying anything, I, I don't know. I'm very. I'm not even jealous of the way they play the Chopin etudes, but there it is. Orchestras are uh, are technically extraordinary, but what really counts is what nobody cares about any longer, which is the music that's being written for these orchestras. Yes. The America is should be ashamed at ashamed at its own shame at still hiring only European conductors because of the inferiority complex that America has, uh, and then hiring European conductors who won't play American music. And but why this uh, inferiority complex by be now? Because although we still are proud of building bitter and bigger and better atom bombs, we still think Europe's better than we are when it comes to culture, in spite of the fact that in painting, for example, in 19... 71, when Rauschenberg won the first prize at the Venice Biennale, and Americans aren't supposed to do that. The Italians and the French are supposed to, but he did. And, and painting has become a kind of a internationalized thing now. But it hasn't happened in music. No, and, God, uh, no. The uh, politi politicizing, the NEA, I would say about the NEA, and I only say it here in private because I wouldn't, and amongst peers, I wouldn't say to the general public, is not all that important. It's, uh, it's a little drop in the bucket. It's very, very small. Without the NEA, artists, just like with censorship, artists are still going to find a way. They can, uh, great art has been, has been produced in hideous periods, and terrible art has been uh, produced in periods of great laxity. Uh, permissiveness. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't feel very optimistic about the world as far as art is concerned, mm -hmm. and I don't know that anybody feels optimistic about the world in other ways. And I always like to end things not by saying, "And now, on a lighter note, let's end." I think it's very healthy to end on a down note because because the things we've been talking about are down, and that's what we need to think about. Mm -hmm. and maybe do something for the arts. Well, how, what do we do? I don't know. Money is very important. Uh, subsidization of one sort or another. Listening to music uh, rather than complaining about it. Or if one is going to complain, one should know what one is complaining about, uh, which certainly uh, Jesse Helms does not. Uh, it's okay for him to complain if, in fact, he had looked at Maplethorpe Pictures or plus thousands of other things like it. But to complain en principe or, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is Philistine. It's the Philistinism that I... I, I don't think, however, that, that uh, many people give a damn or ever will. I think this, I'm rather aristocratic in that area. There's a certain... That doesn't mean I'm any better than anybody else, mm -hmm. but I think that the artist is very specialized, always has been and always will be, and the 1% that cares about what he's doing, those people are not good or bad, but they care in a very specialized way, and I like that, and I live, and you do, and many of the people here in a very small world. But that, I will point out, is the only world that's going to survive. We will not be remembered in the future by the by destroying Iraq. We will be remembered <laughs> by the arts that were produced during the period, even as we remember Greece, Rome, the Elizabethan times. We don't know really much about anything else. Thank you very much, and thank you, David, for, for listening.